Well, I just want to welcome everybody to our Understanding the End Times class. Really appreciate the feedback we've been getting. A lot of people said they're getting a lot out of it and think that it's really helping them in different areas. So really, really appreciate the feedback. And today we're going to talk about um, replacement theology. This We're still in part one, scoffers and doctrines of demons in our Understanding the End Times class. And this is session five, replacement theology. Really, this one is a very important one. It's a, it's a major error in a lot of places today. I committed this error for many years. I'm going to talk about that. But uh, super important that we understand Israel's role and uh, God's view of Israel and the role of the Jewish people. Uh, super important to talk through those things. Um, just to give you an idea, just I want to, you know, before we dive in, I want to do a, a quick review here of some of the different errors we've looked at. And um, the first one we looked at was partial preterism. And you remember partial preterism is the belief that um, a good portion of Matthew 24 and much of the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled in 70 AD. Uh, the, 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 prop, the reason why we're talking about these things um, so much, like partial preterism, for example, this false doctrine, to me, in my opinion, could very well leave the church unprepared for the great shaking that is coming before the Lord returns. It could even lead, you know, God forbid, to apostasy if believers are not prepared to suffer persecution. I mean, if they're taught, okay, things are only going to get better, this, you know, and again, I'm all for an optimistic future, but not telling the truth about the shaking that's coming and the persecution that's coming, it could cause even someone to fall away. It, 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 can, it can give a false hope um, that everything is getting better. So that's why we talked about partial preterism. Uh, and then in the, in the last two sessions, we talked about post-millennialism and, or you could say dominionism, and this is expressed through the seven mountain mandate, which we looked at in detail. This doctrine places, and we talked a lot about this, but it places the need for transformation externally rather than internally. Let me say that again. Postmillennialism places the need externally rather than internally. It looks to revival to be the, the ultimate solution for the transformation of nations rather than seeing revival as being uh, ultimately first and foremost for the transformation of the bride. And then as the bride is internally transformed, then culture is impacted as Christians uh, function as salt and light. So post-millennialism can give a false path towards victory, placing too much of an emphasis on external revival rather than internal transformation. And it can also give a, a false hope of victory that doesn't prepare the church to face trials and opposition and persecution. And so to, now we come to replacement theology. This is a big one, is this doctrine removes Israel and the Jewish people completely out of the picture, distorting how we view the end of the age. And, you know, there's so many prophecies that talk about Israel and the, the Jewish people and God's plan for them at the end of the age. And so, you know, and we're going to talk about this in the next session, but, you know, God's plan for Israel has Jerusalem and the Jewish people at the center stage of what he's doing. Now, there's a lot of other things God's doing, but uh, as you'll see in the next, in the next session is, is, is the Jewish people at center stage of God's end time activity, replacement theology skews our view of the end times. And so, with that said, let's take a deep dive into replacement theology. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and we'll turn to Romans chapter 11. If you, you, hopefully you've read Romans 9 through 11 where Paul really lays out his view on Israel, his doctrine of Israel, and things like that. So highly recommend that you would read Romans chapter 9 through 11, and we're going to talk about some of the verses in that, in that scripture. But in, in Romans eleven eighteen, 18, Paul said, he, he warned, and I want to read it. Let me actually read the scripture, Romans eleven eighteen. 18. He warned the Gentiles, and it's almost as if Paul could sense by the Spirit. There's, there's danger coming to Gentiles who view themselves more important than Israel. And he warns in Romans eleven eighteen. 18, 
And he says, to the, writing to the Gentiles, do not be arrogant toward the branches, but if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. And how quickly the Gentile church, which has been the predominant makeup of the church for almost 2,000 years, how quickly the Gentile church forgot that apostolic admonition from Paul to say, don't, you know, don't be arrogant toward the Jews. Don't be arrogant toward Israel. The root supports you. You don't support the root. And we're going to look at some of the things that have been done in the name of Christianity throughout church history, Christian anti-Semitism. And it's shocking to see the atrocities that have been committed in the name of Jesus Christ toward the Jewish people. All, I believe, a lot of it can be traced back to Gentiles becoming arrogant towards the branch or towards the root instead of realizing the root supports us. So in the reason replacement theology is very important, especially in what we're talking about, is replacement, the, replacement theology skews our view of the end times. When, when we don't see the role of Israel and the role of the, the Jewish people in the end of the age and eschatology, when we don't see that, our view of the end times is skewed. And therefore, it's so important to look at it, but... The other thing that happens, and we're going to look at this as well, is that it, um, when we don't view Israel the way God views Israel, it can lead to Christian anti-Semitism. And we, we see that all throughout church history. It's, it's shocking. We're going to get into some examples of that here in a minute. But if, you have, if you're looking at your notes on page one, um, I define replacement theology. Here's the way I define replacement theology. Just at a, at a simple high level, replacement theology is the belief that the church has replaced God, Israel and God's prophetic agenda. Replacement theology is the belief that the church has replaced Israel in God's prophetic agenda. And I said on page one here, the thinking goes something like this. Since Israel has rejected her promised Messiah and committed the unpardonable crime of killing God, you know, you can look throughout, throughout church history, the, the Gentile church accusing Israel being Christ killers, the Jews have been cast aside forever. The Jewish people are under an eternal curse and their glorious promises have been given exclusively to the church. Thus the church has replaced Israel. And so I just want to say this very direct, that replacement theology is a doctrine of demons. And I'm going to show why in a minute, but it is a doctrine of demons. It is an expression of the diabolical hatred of Satan towards the Jewish people that he's had for thousands of years. And so if we're going to really understand the end of the age and God's plan for the end of the age, all forms of replacement theology have to be deeply rooted out of our heart so that we can really understand God's, uh, God's plan at the end of the age. Now, you know, when you think about replacement theology, and on the one hand, you can understand, okay, well, you know, Israel didn't exist for almost 2,000 years, and so the church, when they would come to the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Malachi, and they would try to interpret, okay, Israel, well, they're not even around. I mean, the Jews have been scattered into the nations, and so... You know, when they came to these different scriptures, they began to allegorize the prophets. And so over, you know, a couple thousand years, 2,000 years or so, 1,800 plus years, the church just ha was handed down this allegorical method of interpreting the prophets. And then all of a sudden, Israel is reborn in 1947, 1948. Israel becomes a nation in 1948. And all of a sudden the church is like, okay, wow, some of these, some people were talking about Israel will be restored and become a nation again. Now it's happened. Well, how do we now look at these prophecies which have been allegorized for so many years? But you can understand that replacement theology was ingrained in the church for centuries just because Israel was not a land. And so they allegorized the prophetic scriptures when Israel did not exist. And it has, it has um, heavily influenced the church to this day. And so even today it has heavily influenced the church. And so let's look at some examples of this. And uh, I, can, I can teach this because I used to embrace replacement theology. 
when I would read Isaiah or when I would read Ezekiel or Jeremiah, whenever it said mentioned Israel, I would replace it with the church or Zion or Jerusalem. I would say, okay, that's just the church. I mean, I, I really, you know, I didn't know better um, until God corrected me. But, you know, for example, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to Isaiah chapter 4. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 4. But Isaiah chapter 4, I'm going to just kind of walk through how I used to interpret Isaiah chapter 4 until the Lord corrected me. But and you probably have read this before, but Isaiah chapter 4, for, and this is, and I'll read it and then kind of explain how I viewed it. Um, chapter 1 or verse 1, for seven women will take hold of one man in that day saying, we will eat our own bread and we will wear our own clothes only let us be called by your name, take away our reproach. So what I did when I came to this is I thought the seven women symbolized the church because in Revelation 2 and 3, there's seven churches. So I said, okay, this means the church is going to have an independent attitude towards the Lord Jesus Christ. We were going to, we're, you know, look, we're going to eat our own bread, wear our own clothes, but we just want to be called by your name. In other words, we want to take it to heaven, but we don't really want to surrender our lives to you. And then I went down in, in verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord, of course, that's the messianic name of Jesus. The Messiah will be beautiful and glorious, and the, pride of, and the fruit of the earth will be for the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. And so what I would say is, oh, okay, God has a remedy to cure the independent, backslidden, lukewarm church. He's going to reveal the beauty and the glory of Jesus Christ. And that's going to wean the church out of her independence. And it, the beauty of the Lord is going to fascinate the church. And through that, God is going to take them through a process of refinement. And then they're going to begin to bear fruit. The kingdom of God is going to begin able to expand. Verse 3. And it will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem, so that would be the church. This is the way I would interpret that. I used to. It would come about that he who is left in the church after God releases the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning, and we'll get to that, is everyone who's recorded for life in Jerusalem will be called holy. And again, I, I've just, I substituted the church in place of Israel. Verse 4, when the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, again I said that's the church, and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. In other words, God is going to take the independent, lukewarm church, the seven women, he's going to reveal the beauty of Jesus, he's going to captivate them and say, wow, he's awesome, he's beautiful, he's glorious, I want to follow him wholeheartedly. Then, then God's going to take them through a process of baptism into fire. The spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning are going to burn them and refine them. And whoever survives that intense dealing without falling away will be called holy. I mean, it sounds great, but I was totally wrong about what it meant. Verse 5, then the Lord would create... Over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies, a cloud by day, even smoke, and the, and the brightness of a flaming fire by night. All the glory will be a canopy, and there will be a shelter to give shade from the heat by day and refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. And so, in other words, uh, that's the way I interpreted Isaiah chapter 4 and, in fact, interpreted that kind of, that kind of uh, method of interpretation throughout the whole book of Isaiah. Now, I remember very clearly, it was like, I just, it was so clear. I remember, I remember where I was. I remember the car I was in. I don't even have the car anymore. When the Holy Spirit, just like a, like a hammer, just corrected me and said, no, Jerusalem means Jerusalem, not the church. Jerusalem means Jerusalem in the Middle East, Israel. And man, I tell you what, my, the light bulb went off in my spirit. And I just, it's, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's like so many, um, it, it was a total paradigm shift for me thinking one way. And I just was like, oh my goodness, Jerusalem means Jerusalem. Israel means Israel. Like, wow, that's how deep and, you know, of a revelation is that, you know? So what I did after... After getting that revelation, my eyes were open, my paradigm had changed, and I was like, you know, 
I, I should really go back and, and study the book of Isaiah. Um, I should study that whole book line by line in its original context. Um, and, I, and I remember I was using this uh, commentary by Alex Motier called The Prophecy Isaiah. It's like 300, I don't even know how many pages. It's really thick, uh, tiny font. And, you know, I, I probably spent about a year or just every morning, I don't want to say every single morning, but many mornings going through the, the book of Isaiah and, and just that, reading that commentary and just like, I was like completely blown away that God has a plan for Israel. And my eyes were open and I was like, oh my goodness, I have been, I have embraced repre- replacement theology for, for, you know, several years, you know. Um, you know, you got another one, another example you could use, you know, the dry bones in Ezekiel 37, you know, prophesy life to the dry bones. The church is the dry bones. Prophesy life. And again, that doesn't mean you can't use that, use that as an application, because um, we certainly can, and I still do that. I say, you know, we need to prophesy life to the dry bones of God's people. But in its original context, that prophecy was written to Israel. And so, you know, throughout church history, even down into today, that many interpreters and teachers, when they come to the Old Testament prophets, they, they replace Israel and Jerusalem with the church. And that is a that's, that is the replacement theology. It is, a, it is an error. It's going to skew the way we view the end of the age. It's going to skew the way we interpret prophecy. Um, even when we come to the New Testament, if we, if we have replacement theology of that paradigm where the church has replaced Israel, when we interpret many different things, even in the New Testament, we're going to misinterpret those because you cannot come into the New Testament and try to interpret uh, Matthew 24, or the book of Revelation without thoroughly understanding the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is repeated like so many times in the book of Revelation. And if you're still under this paradigm of replacement theology, your interpretation of the book of Revelation is going to be very messed up. And in fact, Jesus said in Matthew 24, he said, he said that the, the great tribulation is going to be kicked off by the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. You cannot understand Matthew 24. You cannot understand the book of Revelation until you understand Daniel in its original context, in its original context spoken to Israel and spoken to the Jewish people. Very big, very big. So when, when I was reading through Isaiah, when I used to read it, I would try to apply replacement theology, that, 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 that method of interpreting the scriptures to the whole book of Isaiah. Man, I was so confused. But then when you go back and you look at Isaiah chapter 1, it's the, it's the vision of Isaiah concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Then you're like, oh, wow, this was not written to the church. This was written to Judah and Jerusalem. So anyway, just, just to you know, mention back Isaiah chapter 4, what that prophecy is really talking about is at the end of the age, there is going to be a great trial in the land of Israel. There's going to be a great trial in Jerusalem. The Antichrist is going to rise up. And, he's, and God is going to use the Antichrist in Israel to purify the nation of Israel and to prepare them and for, the, for the reign of Jesus Christ when he comes back. And those who survive that will be called holy. And so, you know, that, that's what I believe the, uh, the interpretation means. Now, let's look at um, Matthew 5.17. In Matthew 5.17, this is really another important thing to understand is, you know, a lot of people use this scripture in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus talks about the law, you know, do not think that I came to abolish the law, uh, but I want to focus on the next phrase, do not think that I came to abolish the prophets. Now, he's not talking about the book of Revelation. He's not talking about even the prophetic writings and the epistles that Paul wrote. He's talking about the Old Testament prophets. Jesus is saying that, he's saying that, do not think I came to abolish the prophets. I did not come to abolish the prophets. I came to fulfill the prophets. Now, that doesn't mean that when in his coming, every single prophecy was ultimately fulfilled. But him being the Messiah, he is now, they were spoken of him. And he now in himself is going to fulfill those, even has been fulfilling those, even as we progress to his second coming. But the Lord has not abolished the prophets. And we looked at even in the last session that 
you know, sometimes interpreters will look at Acts 3.21 and they'll say that Jesus must stay in heaven until the period of restoration of all things. And they'll immediately go and say, which was spoken by the prophets, and they will immediately go to the prophecies of Isaiah and they'll say that the mountain of the Lord's house is going to be the chief of the mountains and all the nations are going to stream to it. There's going to be the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. The problem is those two prophecies were spoken to Jerusalem. They were spoken to Israel. And through replacement theology, we have a skewed view of eschatology. And the way back is to see that God or Jesus has not abolished the prophets. He has fulfilled them. And so, so important, and I can't stress this enough, that it's so important when we come to the New Testament and we read Revelation, and we read Matthew 24, and we read Paul and his epistles, that we, you know, th these, these men who wrote the scriptures were Jewish, and they had a thorough understanding of Israel in the Old Testament set into its original context. And so we also, if we're going to understand prophecy accurately, also have to understand God's plan for Israel and the Jewish people. Okay, so let's go back now and let's turn to Matthew, or let's turn to Romans chapter 9. And we're going to look here for a few minutes at Romans um, 11, but we're going to start with Romans chapter 9, verse 3. And we're going to look at, and I'm sure you probably have read this before, but we're going to look at what it means when Paul used the analogy of the rich root of the olive tree and the wild branches and the natural branches what was Paul talking about? Because what you're going to see is that Gentiles have been grafted into Israel. We have not replaced Israel. We've been grafted into Israel. Now, here's what Paul says in Romans 9, 3, verse 5. Or Romans 9, yeah, 9 verse 3. If I wish that I myself were accursed. That's crazy. I mean, not, I'm going to say crazy, but just think about that. Paul would rather be accursed... Paul would rather go to hell and be eternally damned and, and separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren. That is an intense love that Paul had for his Jewish brethren. My kinsmen, according to the flesh. Verse 4, they are Israelites who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the temple, and the temple services and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh who is over all God bless forever. And so what we see here is that Israel belongs, to Israel belongs the covenants. To Israel belongs the promises. To Israel belongs the adoption of sons. To Israel belongs all of these different things. And what, you know, without going into all the detail, what, what Paul's really talking about is he's building on the covenants that, have, that God made with Israel throughout history. The Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. And so what Paul's saying here is these covenants were made with Israel and you as a, to, a, to the Gentiles, you as a wild olive branch are grafted into that rich root of the olive tree. He's hitting on the covenants. Now, the thing that's very interesting, if you, and we're not going to get into do in depth here, but if you do a deep study, in fact, you can look on dad's, my dad's book, Understanding Your Inheritance in Christ. Um, if you want that, you can just email us. But uh, if you really dive into that book, what you really see is that the Mosaic, the Davidic, and the New Covenants, all of those stem from the Abrahamic Covenant. It's the Abrahamic covenant that the other covenants flow out of. And, and it's a very interesting study. But here's what is so fascinating is in Galatians 3.16, Paul is talking about the Abrahamic covenant. And Paul says, now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Now, notice that it's in the, it's in the singular, not the plural. He does not say, and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. See, what Paul is telling us is that when God made that covenant with Abraham and his seed, he was not looking to Isaac. Isaac. 
He was looking to Christ. He was looking to Messiah. He was looking to, the, to Jesus Christ. In other words, God was making that covenant with Abraham and with Jesus Christ. That's why all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus. Because he is the fulfillment of every one of these covenants. So that is a very important way to look at things is God was not making a covenant with Abraham and Isaac. God was making an, a covenant with Abraham and Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to turn to a very important scripture. It's, it's, especially in the subject, when it, when it comes to the subject of Israel, it's Isaiah chapter 49, verse 3. To me, it's, it's one of the least understood, least talked about scriptures, especially when it comes to the subject of Israel. But it's very, very important that we understand this scripture. And Isaiah's writing in here, and, he, and you can clearly, from the context, realize, okay, he's talking to the Messiah. He's saying, listen to me. The Lord called me from the womb. He called me from the, from the body of my mother. He's made my, my mouth like a sharp sword. Who has a sharp sword? Jesus, Revelation chapter 1. In the shadow of his hand, he has concealed me. He has made me a select arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. Now listen to what verse 3 says. This, this is really an amazing thing. One of the most incredible messianic names given to Jesus Christ is here in verse 3. The Lord says, and he prophesies to Jesus, and he says, you are my servant, Israel, and whom I will show my glory. Did you catch that? Isaiah prophesies about Jesus Christ. We know it's Jesus Christ. He prophesies that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would be named Israel. Yeshua, his name is Israel. That's powerful. There's many ways that God uses the name Israel in Scripture. He uses it for the natural Jewish people and the land. He uses it spiritually. But this one use of the name Israel, when it applies to the Messiah, I think is the is to me one of the most important ways God uses it. He's basically saying, Jesus Christ is Israel. Jesus is the prototype of the nation of Israel. Jesus is whom the promises were made to. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the covenant promises. In him, is he, all the promises of God are yes and amen. This is an incredible statement. And so I think if we take this, and you can even look at it, even, even the way Jesus, who is the, the prototype of what Israel is meant to be, you look at it and in, in in, you look at his life, and he was tested in the wilderness just like for 40 days, just like Israel was meant to be tested for 40 days. They, were, they went into the wilderness, and it was only supposed to be a short time, but yet their, their hardness and their independence and the rebellion caused their delay to be 40 years. But Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days, and he comes up out of the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus prevailed where Israel failed because he is the ultimate expression of what Israel is meant to be. He is Israel as Messiah. And you know, you think about this, especially in the Western world, everyone's, you know, is, there's, there's always these pictures of Jesus, you know, the, the white Caucasians always have Jesus in Hollywood and he's got blue eyes and blonde hair and you're like, wait, wasn't he from the Middle East? Um, you know, and then the black Hebrews, you know, say Jesus was black and there's all this big debate about the eth ethnicity of Jesus and where he came from. But Jesus was and is a Jew from the Middle East. I mean, he did not have blue eyes and blonde hair. He did not look like he came out of Hollywood or America. Jesus is 100% Jewish as God and as man. And, you know, Jesus, just think about it. He went to the temple. He studied the Torah. He celebrated the feast. And he is the ultimate expression of what Israel is meant to be. He is the fulfillment of everything. He is a the fulfillment of the law. When he went, when he celebrated Passover, he was the ultimate Passover lamb who's whose uh, blood was shed so that we might experience complete forgiveness of our sins. He is the fulfillment of Pentecost and the fulfillment of tabernacles. When, when Jesus returns, all the nations, and he fulfills the Feast of Tabernacles, 
all the nations are going to stream to Israel to worship him and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. So he is the ultimate fulfillment of Israel. I heard Derek Prince say one time that, or actually read in his book, he said, if you're if you have anti-Semitic feelings in your heart, you're not going to like heaven very much because on the throne of God is the Lamb of God who is from who is the root of David and the offspring of uh, Israel. He's the, uh, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root and the offspring of David. Um, he is still the king of the Jews. And he's Jewish. The, a Jewish man is enthroned in heaven. And a Jewish man is coming back as God and man, the son of man, and he's going to rule from Jerusalem. A Jewish man is going to rule the world from Jerusalem. And so, you know, that really confronts the anti-Semitism a lot in our hearts that a Jewish man, Jesus is Jewish. Jesus is Israel. And so now we come back, and here my main point in saying all that is when we come back to Romans chapter 11, the rich root of the olive tree, what, what, what Paul's really getting at is the rich root of the olive tree is Jesus Christ. What he's getting at is you as a Gentile were grafted into Jesus Christ. You as a believing Jew were grafted into Jesus Christ. So the rich root of the olive tree is Israel, Jesus Christ. You see what I'm saying? The rich root of the olive tree is Messiah. And the promises that were, the covenant promises that were made to him in the Abrahamic, uh, Mosaic, Davidic, and New Covenant. And as Gentiles, we're grafted into Israel, grafted into Messiah and the promises made to him. So let's look at this in, in Scripture. Romans 11. Romans 11, verse 17 Again, I, I encourage you to read Romans 11 and read Romans 9, 10, and 11 just to get the context here. But Paul's writing in Romans 11, he says, But if some of the branches were broken off, he's talking about unbelieving Jews. If some of the branches were broken off, the unbelieving Jews, the natural thing was for them to accept Christ, but they rejected him. Well, many of them did. And you, talking to Gentiles, you being a wild olive, a wild olive branch, you were grafted in among them and became a partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. That, I believe that rich root of the olive tree is Jesus Christ and the covenant promises made to him. And that encompasses what it means to be Israel. Do not be arrogant toward the branches, but if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. And so anyway, just, to, just a, a quick summary is the rich root of the olive tree is Jesus Christ and the covenant promises made to him. The wild branches that were grafted in are the Gentiles. The natural branches that were grafted in are, are Better said, not broken off were the Messian, the believers like Paul and John, who were Jewish, who believed in the Messiah, Jesus. And then the, the, the natural branches that were broken off are the unbelieving Jews who rejected Jesus as the Messiah. So, very important. So, very, very important scripture, very important passage. Um, the question we want to ask as it comes to replacement theology is Has God rejected the Jews? Has God rejected the Jews? You know, if you read church history, many revered church fathers, even Martin Luther, uh, believed that God had rejected the Jews. You can look in the early and medieval church and just, you see some, and we'll look at some examples in a minute, you see some of the statements made that God has rejected them and God hates them and they're, they're cursed to the eternal fires of hell forever and, you know, all these statements and, you know, God has rejected the Jews in, in favor of the Christians and that's been said throughout church history. And, that, and that's the question we want to ask now because really replacement theology is, is grounded in this idea that God has rejected the Jews forever. And now is that true? Well, Paul said no. It absolutely is not true. Romans 11, 1 through 2, Paul says emphatically God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. 
So, so Paul is very, very clear. God has not rejected Israel. God has not rejected the Jewish people. God has not rejected them. If you need more convincing, uh, Jeremiah 31, 35 through 37, um, the Lord says, Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that his waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. And he's talking about Israel here. If this fixed order departs from before me, talking about the sun and the moon and the stars, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. In other words, the Lord is saying, look, as long as you see the sun in the sky and the moon at night and the stars, as long as you see that, Israel will never be rejected. That's what God's saying. Israel will never be rejected. The Lord says, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will cast off the offspring of Israel for what they have done. And any scientist knows that the universe is expanding and the universe cannot be measured. And so God is telling us that, that he will never reject his people, the Jewish people. He will never reject Israel. He, was, he is for them and not against them. There's a lot more that could be said about that, but we won't go into all that here. The other thing I want to mention is we have to understand when, in God in restoring Israel and all the prophecies in the Old Testament prophets, in God in restoring Israel, he's not restoring Israel because they're, they're special, they have this unique bloodline, they have been, you know, God, they're not God's favorites. On the contrary, the Lord says in Ezekiel 36, 22, he says, he says to them, it is, he says to Israel, it is not for your sake that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. In other words, God's saying, I'm not acting because you're good. I'm not acting because you're special. I'm not acting because you have this bloodline. I'm not acting because you're called Jews. I'm acting on behalf of Israel because of my holy name, because I want to show that I am faithful to what I've said. So God is, on, God is moving in the nation of Israel and God is fulfilling his word to Israel for his namesake, not because of anything they do, they've done or anything special they've done or because they kept the law or whatever. It's because God is moving to show, his, to show the nations that he is good. So now we've talked about replacement theology. We talked about what it is, how it manifests, the truth of how the church has not replaced Israel. We've been grafted into Israel. And so now we want to talk about Christian anti-Semitism, which I believe is the fruit of replacement theology. Replacement theology is the root. Christian anti-Semitism is the fruit. And, you know, Paul talked about in Ephesians 2.15 that God's goal was to take the two and the Jew and the Gentile, and make them one new man in Jesus Christ. That's God's goal. That is God's objective, is to make Jew and Gentile one in Jesus Christ. However, just read church history, and you see the exact opposite has happened. I don't know how much you've, you've read about the... Christian anti-Semitism in church history, but it's really, really uh, grieving when you see what the church in the name of Jesus Christ has done to the Jewish people. And, how, and I, I believe it's replacement theology that is the uh, root that drives that fruit. I mean, just look at the history, just, you know, slander, false accusations, church policies, forced conversions to Christianity, mandated deportations, uh, banishment into ghettos and murder. The, the church for hundreds and hundreds of years has oppressed and persecuted the Jewish people. But God wants to make the Jew and the Gentile one new man in Jesus Christ. That's the heart of God, his heart. And so we're just going to look at some, some examples here. In the notes, you can go into to more detail. But even beginning, even as early, I mean, even, you know, a couple hundred, a hundred or so years, hundred plus years after uh, the church was birthed, Jesus was resurrected. Um, different leaders, Ignatius of Antioch, who was martyred in the first century, said the church is the new Israel, and Israel's prophets were Christians before their time. 
Justin Martyr said that to the Jews, the scriptures are not yours, they're ours. And, uh, you know, just, just looking at it and, and just seeing this, even, you know, just you, know, you, you name famous church fathers in, throughout the early church and medieval church. I've got some of them mentioned in my notes. You, you look at them and m- many of them were infected with anti-Semitism because they believed God had cursed the Jews because they were Christ killers. And so replacement theology drove that. You think about anti-Semitic church councils. Think about, think about this. In Acts 15, uh, the crisis came onto the scene where all of a sudden all these Gentiles, Paul comes back from a missionary journey and all these Gentiles are getting saved and he's going to report to the apostles, the Jewish apostles in Jerusalem. And he's like, man, all these people are getting saved. The Spirit of God is moving. Revival's breaking out. All these things are happening. You know, what do we do? It's so interesting. The Jewish leaders, the Jewish apostles said, you know, they basically said, We're, we don't need to try to make them Jewish. We don't need to make them try to be like us. You know, we've been trying to keep the law for, you know, however many years, and we keep failing. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. In other words, the Jewish apostles in the first church council did not try to make Gentiles become Jews. But in the church councils, you know, even, even starting in 325 A.D. at the Nicene Council, the, you begin to see these church policies introduced where the, the leaders of the church were like, you know, we, we don't really want Easter and Passover to be the same day because it's too, Passover's too Jewish and Christianity's different. And so they, they made Easter separate from when Passover will be celebrated. But, you know, that's just the beginning. After that, it's like they started introducing all these church policies throughout the years. And, and you can look at some of these throughout my notes, but in, in 1215, the, the Fourth Lateran Council, con- convened by Pope Innocent III, one of, the, one of the laws they instituted to the Jews is they said the Jews had to wear a yellow badge to distinguish them from Christians. It was called the, the, the badge of shame. That sounds very eerily similar to the same badge Hitler forced the Jews to wear right before the full-scale Holocaust. And in fact, what you'll see in a minute is a lot of the the Third Reich's policies toward the Jews were basically taken from the church policies throughout history and rebranded into Nazi Germany. And, And so Hitler didn't have to look very far to persecute the Jews. He just had to look to the church. It's really, really a a sobering thing. Then you got the Crusades, and we won't go into a lot of detail, but just just imagine the Crusaders are launching from Europe, and they're saying, you know, we're going to wage holy war and capture Jerusalem from the Muslim infidels. But in that conquest, even in 1099, that I think it was 10,000 Jews were killed by the Crusaders. And in fact, that Jewish community didn't come back for many years after that. So... I think historians have estimated that historians have estimated that um, many thousands of Jews were killed in the Crusades, and you can just imagine you can imagine why a lot of Jewish people just the, the the cross and Jesus Christ is such an affront to them is because these Crusaders were marching to the Holy Land, killing you know killing some killing Jews with a cross on their chest, you know. Um, the next thing, the Spanish Inquisitions, and this, this word Inquisition is really an inquiry, and it was a tribunal created to quiz Jewish people in Spain after the king converted to Catholicism and became a Christian. They, they started to inquire to Jews. They said, okay, basically you have, and I'm, gonna, I'm really summarizing here. You can get a lot more detail in the notes, but you basically have one, two options. You can, you can uh, convert to Christianity, and that conversion to Christianity means you've got to renounce everything Jewish. You've got to renounce the feast. You've got to renounce the, the law. You've got to renounce all the different things that, you, that, are, that define you as a Jew. You've got to renounce all of that to convert to, to Christianity, or if you don't, then, then you are going to face, uh, you're going to face uh, being burned at the stake. You, you know, you either are baptized as a Christian or you're going to be burned at the stake. And 
Historians have said that some 30,000 Jews were, were burned at the stake during the Spanish Inquisitions as, as the church just drove the Jews either to forced conversion or to execution. All, you know, again, they probably, most of this coming from this, this rage infected from replacement theology. The one that really gets me is Martin Luther. Martin Luther, he's one of my heroes. I, I just, I look at Martin Luther. He, he's just one of my, one of those guys that are just one of my heroes. Reading about the Reformation and, you know, Martin Luther, I said this on, on Sunday, Martin Luther was on the toilet. You know, the, the Reformation started. It's, I don't, sorry, it's my potty talk, but Martin Luther on the toilet gets a revelation from God of justification by faith. And the Lord reveals to him that the just shall live by faith. And so Martin Luther realized it's not by works that we're saved. It is by faith. It is the just shall live by faith. That when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, he justifies us. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, he declares you are righteous. You are righteous. And so that, that revelation launched this incredible reformation. I'm sure you've read about it, but in 517, Martin Luther, or 1517, Martin Luther puts his 95 Theses on the door and it starts the Reformation and, you know, just all the things Martin Luther did, all the books he wrote and the translating the Bible into German and through the Gutenberg printing press, just, you know, getting it out not only throughout Germany but all of Europe. I mean, just one of the greatest moves of God, the Reformation. I mean, so many things. I mean, Western culture has been shaped by the Reformation. America would not be America without the Reformation. I mean, Martin Luther did so many things and, you know, risking his life to stand up uh, to the Catholic Church and, you know, accused of heresy, excommunicated, all that. And, you know, Martin Luther changed the way we, that the church was done, that the church split from Catholic, the Catholics and the Protestants, just so many things Martin Luther did. But you may not realize this, Martin Luther became, towards the end of his life, very anti-Semitic when the Jews did not begin converting to Christianity. And Martin Luther wrote a book called On the Jews and Their Lies. And Martin Luther, I'll just read a few things that Martin Luther said, but he said that aside from the devil, you have no enemy more venomous, more desperate, more bitter than the Jews. They are the children of the devil. We all can be rid of the unbearable, devilish burden of the Jews. Luther even had a way to deal with the Jews. He recommended their synagogues be set on fire, their homes broken into and destroyed, their prayer books and Talmuds confiscated, their rabbis forbidden to teach under threat of death, their passports and traveling priv privileges prohibited. And, and what, what is, what's crazy is many years later, what, 400-something years later, Hitler wanted to honor Martin Luther for his teachings. And on November the 10th, 1938, on Luther's birthday, the Third Reich celebrated his birthday by carrying out their first large-scale Jewish persecution, wrecking thousands of, of Jewish shops and burning synagogues to the ground, broke into uh, the Jewish homes, beat, arrested, and killed innocent Jews, known as the Night of Broken Glass, Hitler basically took the, the anti-Semitic teachings of the church, the anti-Semitic policies, the anti-Semitic teachings of Luther, all that has been passed down throughout church history, and he used that to enforce his final solution. It's really a sobering, sobering thing of how the church played a role in the final solution. And, you know, Hitler, Hitler stated that... Um, he, sta he stated, I'm acting as the Lord's agent by fighting the Jews. I'm doing the Lord's work. It was so embedded into the church that they thought uh, murdering Jewish people was part of God's work because of the anti-Semitic policies that had been passed down for, for many, many years. And in the notes, you know, without going into it now, but in the, I've got a, in the notes I've got a link to a document called Christian Anti-Semitism that I, I wrote that goes into a lot of the detail. I'll recommend you reading it. But you can see there's a table that I created that, that shows 
church policies throughout history that were against the Jews and Hitler taking those same policies and using those as a motivation or, or a kind of a blueprint or prototype for his persecution of the Jewish people. So anyway, it's a, you know, so I could go on in a lot more detail, but the, the point is, the point is replacement theology always leads to Christian anti-Semitism. Replacement theology always leads to Christian anti-Semitism, and especially as it relates to the end times, replacement theology will skew our view of eschatology. Replacement theology will skew the way we view the end times, the way we interpret the scriptures, the way we interpret Matthew 24 or the book of Revelation, the way we interpret the epistles. And so it's so important that we understand the, really the diabolical nature. I call, I call replacement theology a doctrine of demons. It is a doctrine of demons to say the church has replaced Israel when we've been grafted into Israel. And so in the next session, we're going to look at Daniel's 70-week prophecy. We're going to move to, a, to part two. But in looking at Daniel's 70-week prophecy, it's so, it becomes just so uh, uh, clear that the entire, what many scholars believe is the backbone of all end-time prophecy, Daniel's 70 weeks, that prophecy was written specifically to the Jewish people living in the land of Israel, possessing the city of Jerusalem. And so all that, that unfolds has, all that unfolds in, 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 at the end of the age, even in the book of Revelation, in fact, so much of what Daniel wrote in his book, in the book of Daniel, is repeated in the book of Revelation. And so, but at the center stage of that prophecy is the city of Jerusalem and the Jewish people. And so, if we have a replacement theology paradigm of the way we interpret Scripture, we're going to miss so much of what God's doing. We're going to distort uh, so many, so much of the prophetic writings our interpretation of the book of Revelation is going to be off. It's going to be not what God was speaking or saying. You cannot come to the book of Revelation until you're thoroughly grounded in the book of Daniel. And we're going to do that uh, starting in the next session. But replacement theology is a diabolical doctrine of demons that must be rooted out of the church. See, God, uh, Peter said in Acts 3.21 that that the restoration of all things which God spoke by the mouth of his prophets. He says Jesus is not going to come back until the time of restoration which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets. That means Isaiah and Daniel and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Malachi because Acts was not written before the book of Acts was written before the book of Revelation. So he's talking about the Old Testament prophets who were prophesying about the plan of God for the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. And so that's why, that's why replacement theology is so important that we overcome it and understand God's plan for Israel. And so as we wrap up part one and move to part two, these three errors we've talked about, partial preterism, post-millennialism or the seven mountain mandate or dominionism, whichever terminology you want to use, or replacement theology, these are so important that we get the truth about these. And so I just encourage you, go into the notes, um, really study the notes, study the scriptures that are in the notes, and just ask God to reveal this to you. Um, ask the Lord to show you the truth. See, this is all about you getting the truth. It's not just, you know, you know I'm, I believe it because this teacher said it or I believe it because that teacher said it. It's about you getting along with the Lord and the Spirit, you know, the, the, with the Word and the Spirit, and asking, okay, Lord, show me from your Word the truth. Show me, your, show me from Isaiah or Jeremiah or whatever. Show me the truth about this in the Scriptures. You want to get the truth of this uh, for yourselves and not rely on this person or that person or this person says this or whatever. You want to get it from yourself. And so just to bring this to an end, replacement theology will skew our view of the end times, therefore we need to see the church has not replaced Israel, we've been grafted into Israel, and Israel is Jesus Christ, and the covenant promises made to him. Amen.